The images used in this material are solely for entertainment purposes and do not reflect or depict the actual stories, events, or characters from the Torah of the Hebrew Bible. Any resemblance or similarities to the content of the Torah are purely coincidental. The purpose of this content is to provide a creative and imaginative interpretation, which should not be construed as a factual or historical representation of the biblical narratives. The stories, teachings, and values presented in the Torah are of deep cultural, religious, and historical significance and should be understood and studied within their proper context. It is recommended to consult authentic religious texts, scholars, or trusted sources for a comprehensive understanding of the Torah and its teaching. A person needs to know that if he's making the makom, he's making Hashem Barach happy because he's bringing his children back. He's bringing his creations back to him. Even if it's literally bringing goyim to become Noahides. It's also a mitzvah. It's not a bigger mitzvah. It shouldn't supersede a mitzvah of bringing a Jew back, but nonetheless it's a mitzvah. All a goyim. Because here it's talking about Mesamechet Abliyot. Abliyot is creations. Rashi over here says, this is because you're bringing a Torah to the world that's pure. That's Lishma. Now who is this Rashi that we should listen to him? Rashi's father was Rabbi Yitzchak. So anyway, Rabbi Yitzchak, he, he was Kodesh Kodeshim. Very simple person. And, uh, but had Yirat Shamaim of the generation, 900, 1,000 years ago almost. There was no such thing as atheist back then. No one had the foolishness of today, being an atheist. You could be a kofer, but not an atheist. Heretic, because you have desires, you have wants, and things like that, yes. But atheist, that didn't exist until recent generations. No one was that stupid back then. But Rabbi Tzhaki, Misked didn't have any kids. Him and his wife loved each other for many years. No children, though. And not only no children, no money either. Struggling like we see homeless people struggling today. Back then, that was normal. Everybody was like that. Everybody was poor. One day, his wife tells him, Honey, there's no food. Not that there's a, uh, we don't have a lot to eat. Maybe we're just going to eat chicken today. Or maybe we're going to just eat bread. No, there's, there's just nothing. There's no food. There's nothing. Go, maybe go do some work. Maybe get some money. Just do something. He goes in the field. Talks to Hashem, prays to Hashem. Looks down, he sees a beautiful rock. Picks up the rock. This might be worth something. Nice rock. Brings it to his wife. Honey, this must be worth something. It's a nice, such a nice rock like this. She says, yeah, it's a really nice rock. Maybe we can get uh, lunch and dinner for it. To be me, simple people. They go to the jeweler. The jeweler, Baruch Hashem, had Yirat He says, he looked, at this, he looked at this. He almost had a heart attack. He goes, you know what this is? This is such a rare diamond that only the king of this faraway country has such a thing in his throne. This is, this is, this is, where did you find this? Where just, well, how'd you get such a thing? He goes, please, please, let me sell it for you. Let me sell it for you. He goes, no, I, what, what are you going to get for it? Uh, uh, maybe we can get a lunch and dinner. He goes, what lunch and dinner? You are officially the richest man in the, in the world. In the city, you're huge. Whatever you want. Here, here's a couple of thousand dollars. Just, just, uh, I'll pay you commission. Just let me sell this thing for you. Okay. Give him a few dollars. He, uh, they eat, they drink, they this, they that. He advertises the rock. Lo and behold, this king from the faraway country finds out he has the rock. And as you would have it, this is the rock that he needs. This is the diamond that he needs. Because the diamond that he had was lost. Accidentally, on purpose, somebody lost it. And uh, he has to replace it because a throne without missing rock uh, looks terrible. So he sent some uh, of his uh, people to go inspect, inspect the rock. They came, they saw. Like, yeah, okay, this is good. Where's the owner? We're going to bring him to our king and he's going to bite on the spot. So he calls Rabbi Yitzhaki, Rabbi Yitzhaki, listen, I got you the buyers. Not only is it a buyer, it's a buyer with money for sure. Who is it? It's the king himself. 
okay. Sounds good. So I have to go with them? Yeah, you have to go on a trip. You go on a boat. And uh, you show it to the king. You show up to the king. He sees you. He's going to give you all the millions and millions of dollars. You go home with a chest full of diamonds and cash and everything else. They'll honor you. They'll respect you. They'll have a party for you. Okay. He goes on the ship. Tells his wife, okay, I'll be back. At least when we come back, we'll have some food. We're not going to have to worry about money. We could open a yeshiva. We could open this. We could do this. He's on the ship. And he starts hearing the two people from the king talking. They start talking about the king. It's like, wow, you know, the king's going to be really happy. He's going to be really, really happy. Because this rock, this diamond, this special diamond... It completes his worship for his idol. Because that's exactly what his idol likes. His idol, his false god, loves this rock. Loves this type of diamond. And the king has been sad since it's been missing. So now that his idol is going to be happy, he's going to be happy. As soon as Rabbi Yitzchaki thought, wait, I'm going to go and help Avodah Zarah, I'm going to go and make millions and millions of dollars off of Abu Dazara. Chas v'shalom. But the problem is, if I tell these people I don't want to sell, they'll just kill me and take the rock. So what do I do? He thought for a second, Mesiat Dishmaya, he had the idea. What's the idea? He says, this rock, you know how much this rock, he's showing off to them. Because you know how much this diamond is worth? They look at them and goes, yeah, obviously we know how much it's worth. That's what we're bringing you. We're bringing the honor of our king because we know how much it's worth. Because yeah, but this rock, you know what it is. This rock could change everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Relax with the showing off, buddy. We know. We know it's worth a lot. But you know this rock. And, took, and he makes pretend as if he falls over. The rock falls over, overboard into the ocean. It's gone. A hundred and fifty million dollars gone. He starts going crazy. Oh no, what happened? They feel so bad for him that they don't kill him because they're like, we're gonna kill him. The guy just lost $150 million in front of our eyes. We're gonna kill him too. He's already killed himself. They get to the other side. There is a, oh, you know, they're all expecting them. Hey, how are you? No, no, don't ask. Put this guy back on the boat. He's a um, scan, he's a crazy person. What do you mean? He's a, yeah, we're going to tell you the whole story. They tell him, listen, this guy had $150 million. Yes, he, he has 150 cents in the bank. 150 cents. A dollar fifty has in the bank. But he had $150 million in his hand. And he just dropped it in the ocean. Everybody's like, wow. Let him go. He's me scared. But two for me, Lord. He's a, he's a <laughs> skin. This guy, mental institution. Send him home. Don't do anything. Don't, don't yell at him. No, he's already suffering for the rest of his life. He goes back on the boat, happy as can be that he just lost $150 million. As soon as he gets off the boat, back home, he sees some old man covered in a robe, getting closer and closer to him. And then as soon as he's right up in his face, right, right, now, right at him, he grabs him and goes, you are going to have a son this year. And leaves. After the shock, he runs home and he tells his wife the good news. Honey, I have amazing news. Yeah, where, where, where's, the, where's the money? Where's the hundred fifty? It's coming in the trucks. It's coming with the caravans. Where she's looking for, for the caravans, for the horses. It was a short trip, but hey, I mean, you don't need to go. Maybe they decided to give you the money now. Because no, no, I have fantastic news. Okay. First, I lost the diamond. She said, that's the good news. That's the good news. What's the, what's, that's the good news. He goes, it gets even better. I just saw Eliyahu Navi in his blue eyes. I just saw Eliyahu Navi, and Eliyahu Navi said, we're going to have a son. That year, they had a son. What they call him? Rashi. Why did Rashi come to Rabbi Yitzchaki? Why? Because Hashem Yitbarach saw, you are willing to give up everything for me. I'll give you somebody that's going to publicize that for the rest of the, rest of the world. 
you're willing to give up every you're willing to give up all the recognition, all the money, all the fame, all the stuff you need. For what? Not to make one sin that no one will even say it's a sin. Why? No one's gonna know. It's not like there's a bunch of rabbis uh, next to the king saying, No, 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 you can't sell it to him. Uh, we're gonna put you on cherem. No, well, if there was any rabbis say, Listen, you're gonna give my sale, right? You're gonna give my sale. Sell it, sell it. You're gonna give my sale, though. No one is gonna be with other than the Shem, no one's gonna be a witness to this sin. Person has Yirat Shamaim, he knows that Yirat Shamaim is not about what you do in front of people. Yirat Shamaim is what you do when you're not in front of people because you know that Hashem is there. And that's why he had the merit to have a son to publicize the Torah to such an extent that if it wasn't for Rashi, we today would not understand a single word in the Gemara, a single word in the Tanakh, single word. We wouldn't understand anything. You cannot read Torah without Rashi. You can't. You read Torah without Rashi, you might as well read Chinese. You might as well read... Uh, you, might, you have no idea what you're doing. Why? You're going to read like the Christians. You're going to read it literally. You're going to read everything literally. You're going to think that, uh, you know, that uh, um, Shaul HaMelech became king at one years old. Because it says Shaul HaMelech, when he became king, it was uh, like a baby, one-year-old baby. So people think, oh yeah, the Christians think, oh yeah, Shaul HaMelech became king when he was one years old. How are you going to become a king when you're one years old? What, are you retarded? Is something wrong with you? How do you become it? What are you going to do? Gaga, gaga, ga, ga, kill them? What are you going to say? Oh, change my diaper. Okay, then go kill them. Okay, change the diaper first though. Like, what are you going to say? Shaul HaMelech became king at one years old. Is something wrong with people? No, meaning Shaul HaMelech, when he became king, he was so clean of sins. He was so holy. He was as clean as a one-year-old baby. That's what it means. But the imbeciles that uh, Kofrim, heretics and all kinds, say, no, no, it was a one-year-old baby king. A little baby king. Rabotai, learning Torah is no joke. It's funny, but it's no joke. Why? Because there's a lot of reward that Hashem wants to give us. A lot of reward that Hashem wants to give us. Ultimately, the reason why is because the Kabbalah says that Hashem created the world for the sake of sharing His goodness. Because He's good. And therefore, he wants to create good, as we've talked about many times in the past. So when somebody learns Torah Lishma, learns Torah for the sake of Torah, follows Hashem for the sake of following Hashem, not because it makes sense to him, not because he's expecting to have some type of a reward, but simply because Hashem said so. This enables Hashem to carry out his ultimate desire, which is to give him good. Hashem created you to give you good, but he also created a law that he's not able to give you good unless you do good. So by doing the ultimate good of following Torah for the sake of following Torah, you are enabling Hashem to do what he exists to do, which is to do good, to give you good. The only reason you, you're, you exist is for him to give you good. So by learning Torah Lishma, you're enabling Hashem. In essence, you've become partners with Hashem in fulfilling His desire, if you can even say such a thing. So to speak, this is the ultimate love that you can show Hashem. And that's why the next part says, a person that does such a thing, It makes him fit to be righteous, devout, fair, and faithful. This learning Torah Lishma, or actually first says, This Torah will clothe him in humility and fear of God. And it makes him fit to be righteous, devout, fair, and faithful. Meaning that when a person learns Torah for the sake of learning Torah, he doesn't have to have any ulterior motives. He doesn't have to have any ambitions. Oh no, I'm going to learn because I want to become some big rabbi. I'm going to learn because I'm going to write a book. 
I'm going to learn because I want to do this. I want to learn. No, no, no. The ultimate good that you can attain in this world, you can attain simply by learning Torah Lishma. You can perfect your Midot by simply learning Torah for the sake of learning Torah. And all of the success that Hashem wants to give you, reward that Hashem is going to give you, He's giving you. You don't have to have that desire yourself. You're going to get it anyway. In fact, if you're doing it for that desire, you're ruining it yourself. Mm-hmm.